Yes, today we are looking at 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. But we're just looking at the first two verses as we introduce this section in Thessalonians on personal holiness, second coming of Christ, and love. So we'll read just 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 1 and 2. Finally then, brothers, we ask and urge you in the Lord Jesus, that as you receive from us how you ought to live and how you ought to please God, just as you are doing, that you do so more and more. For you know what instructions we gave you through the Lord Jesus. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we praise you, we exalt you as a holy God who hates sin, but yet is so gracious to us in the gift of your Son. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for your grace, your goodness, your mercy to us, your kindness to us, you saving a people for your very possession that would give you glory. We pray that this would be used for your name's sake. This passage, our ears would be open, our hearts would be changed. We'd be transformed to your glory. Amen. Kevin DeYoung says it plain and clear. The hole in our holiness is we don't really care much about it. Passionate exhortation to pursue gospel-driven holiness is barely heard in most of our churches. It's not that we don't talk about sin or encourage decent behavior. Too many sermons are basically self-help seminars on becoming the better you. A.W. Tozer says it plain and clear too. You cannot study the Bible diligently and earnestly without being struck by the obvious fact that the whole matter of personal holiness is highly important to God. But neither do you have to give a long study to the attitudes in modern Christian believers to discern that by and large we consider the expression of true Christian holiness to just be a matter of a personal option. Hmm. Lord, search our hearts and minds. Let us be a people who by the grace of God take holiness seriously in Jesus' name. Amen. Here in this passage, we see things ultra clear from Paul the Apostle. Paul calls them to holiness in the Lord. But before we dive into these two verses, we really need to understand the context of what's really going on here in this passage. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 1-2, to two, those two verses are really the introduction to chapters 4 and 5. The rest of what Paul says with regards to holiness and the second coming of Christ. But I really want to ask and answer two questions before we look at these two verses. We kind of want to set the stage of what's after it and what comes before it as well. What are these commands of holiness that Paul exhorts them with that's lacking in their faith? And number two, what precedes these exhortations and what follows? And that helps us understand personal holiness as well. So what are these commands that Paul is talking about? Paul actually has 19 or so commands things that he exhorts them with. In chapter 4, verses 3 to 8, God calls them to God-honoring sexual sexuality, meaning that sexual intimacy is between one man, one woman, one biological man, one biological woman, in the confines of the boundary of marriage. It is the will of God that they stay sanctified in holiness with regards to God honoring sexuality. Number two, in chapter four, nine to 12, although they had already been loving and they loved Paul, they were loving one another. Paul exhorts them to love more and more. Number three, in chapter four, 13 to 18, Paul deals with the coming of the Lord and what happens to those who have died before Jesus has come again. 
Number five, or sorry, in number four, in chapter five, one to 11, Paul here deals with the timing of the coming of the Lord. Also the application of the coming of the Lord. How does the coming of the Lord Jesus apply to your life? Chapter 5, verse 8. But since we belong to the day, let us be sober, having put on the breastplate of faith and love, and for a helmet, the hope of salvation. Number 5. Chapter 5, verse 12 to 13. This church had been dis disrespecting the leadership, the authority of the church. And Paul exhorts them to respect and esteem those who labor with the word among them. Number 6 and 5.14, there seemed to be a group of people who thought that Jesus was coming. They didn't think it was necessary to work. They had become lazy. They would be the type of people who would say, sell your stock, sell your property, sell everything. Don't worry about working. Jesus is coming, they would say. And Paul addresses this issue of laziness. And then Paul launches into 13 more commands in chapter 5, verse 14 to 22. Number seven, encourage the faint-hearted. Number eight, help the weak. Number nine, be patient with them all. Number 10, 515, see that no one repays evil for evil. We're not to have a vengeful attitude. Number 11, seek to do good to one another. Number 12, verse 16, rejoice always. We're to have an attitude of joy. 13, 5, 17, pray without ceasing. 14, 5, 18, give thanks in all circumstances. This is the will of God that we overflow with thankfulness. 15, verse 19 of chapter 5, don't quench the spirit. Allow the spirit of God to move and work in your life and don't put out the Holy Spirit. Don't put out the spirit's fire in your life. 16, 5, verse 20, don't despise prophecies. 17, 5 verse 21, test everything. 18, hold fast to what is good. 5 verse 22, abstain from every kind of evil. So we really have nine commands or nine issues that were lacking in their faith or things that they needed to focus on or do even more and more. They weren't a perfect church, but what church really is perfect? But they were called to progress in personal holiness. It wasn't an option. It wasn't just kind of a friendly suggestion. They were called to progress in holiness. Now the second thing is I want to look at what precedes and follows these commands. And it's absolutely a mind blow. Prayer sandwiches this passage of personal holiness. Prayer. And this is something that we immediately need to put into practice. Note that Paul launches into prayer concerning their love and their holiness in chapter 3, verse 12 to 13. He says, And may the Lord make you increase and abound in love for one another and for all as we do for you. He prays that their love would abound. Verse 13 of chapter 3. So that he may establish your hearts blameless in holiness before our God and Father at the coming of our Lord Jesus with all the, his saints. Then Paul launches in chapter 4 verse 1 to chapter 5 verse 22 of personal instructions, guidance. And then what follows that in 1 Thessalonians 5 verse 23 is Paul again launches into prayer concerning their personal holiness. Chapter 5, verse 23. Now may the God of peace himself sanctify you completely and may your whole spirit and soul and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus. Isn't that amazing? Not only is the grace of God the foundation for our personal holiness, Paul shows us by example that prayer should be at the start in the end of our personal holiness. And now we can come to this passage. We've seen that it's, we've seen the commands. We've seen that Paul starts and ends with prayer. Let's look at these introductory verses. Chapter 4, verse 1, the first part of it. He starts out, finally then, 
literally this could read finally therefore and you might think it's odd he says finally and then he writes two more chapters you think he'd he'd end it right there but what paul is doing is he's changing the topic chapter four and five are different than ver chapters one two three chapter one paul was thankful for the work of the lord chapter one is all about god's work of grace salvation among the thessalonians chapters two and three mainly focused upon paul's relationship and sylvanus's and timothy's relationship with the thessalonian church and we know that paul hoped that he could travel to thessalonica but satan hindered him satan hindered that trip so timothy is sent and he brings back a good report but there's some things that are lacking in their faith and so Paul now addresses these issues. Finally, the issues that are lacking in your faith. And he says in 3 verse 10, And we pray most earnestly night and day that we may see you face to face and supply what is lacking in your faith. Paul can't go, but he's going to write these things that are lacking in, the, in their faith. The word then there in the ESV is the word that's traditionally translated as therefore finally then or finally therefore and whenever we see a therefore or even a then but we'll go with therefore we must find out why the therefore is therefore when paul uses this therefore word what he's getting at here is because the lord has done this work of grace in the thessalonians the lord had saved the thessalonians the Lord had given the Thessalonians new life through Jesus Christ. They were dead. God made them alive through Jesus Christ. The Lord called and loved the Thessalonian church, like he says in chapter 1, verse 4. For we know, brothers, they're loved by God. That's a perfect love, and that he has chosen you. As well, God has dealt with their sin by pouring out the wrath of God upon Jesus Christ. And that's why he can say in 1 Thessalonians 1 verse 10, Jesus rescues us from the wrath to come. The punishment that they deserved for their sin has been brought upon Christ and they're rescued from that wrath. They're free from sin. Therefore, because of this calling of God, the love of God upon them, the work of Christ on their behalf, because the Lord has done such a work among them, they're to respond by obedience, flowing from the grace that God has given them. We see this structure in many of Paul's books. Actually, pretty much most of them. In Romans, Paul spends the first eight chapters explaining the gospel. The gospel is the power of God chapter 1 verse 16 and then he goes on in chapters 1 2 and 3 to explain we each one of us are sinful and then Christ Jesus is how we are made right with God by faith alone through grace alone in Christ alone and then he goes on to speak about justification the results of justification we're dead to sin and some the work of the Holy Spirit and the believer and then he spends three chapters 9 10 11 speaking about the nation of Israel, and then he launches into Romans 12, verse 1. Hear what he says. I appeal to you, brothers, therefore, by the mercy of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. The gospel is preached, therefore, by the mercy of God, live holy lives. Paul also does this in Colossians. Paul, after he's explained to the Colossian church that Jesus is supreme, he's the head of the church, the fullness of God dwells in Jesus Christ. Christ Jesus' work on the cross cleanses us from all sin. Our record of judgment, pff, gone, wiped out. Jesus has brought reconciliation to us by God through means of the cross. What does he say? In Colossians 3, verse 5, Therefore, because of Christ's work, raising us to new life, put to death what is earthly in you, sexual immorality, 
impurity, passion, evil desire, and covetousness, which is idolatry. So this is what Paul is doing here. Paul lays the groundwork that salvation is by grace, and of course, sanctification. This is sanctification is the act by which we become more holy by the grace of God. This is what Paul's getting at. He lays the groundwork for salvation and grace, the grace of God out of that flows sanctification. And he continues, Brothers, <clears throat> we ask and urge you in the Lord Jesus. Here we see that Paul addresses them as brothers. And of course that includes sisters. This is a term of endearment. And Paul gives two specific commands to the Thessalonians. He asks and he urges. He asks and urges. First, he asks. This is more of a request, but it's an urgent request. It's urgent because this request is in the Lord Jesus. It's not a wimpy, oh, can you, can you just please, please, pretty please do this for me? This is a serious request because holiness to the Lord is a serious issue in serious business. Next, he urges or exhorts. This word has already been used in, in uh, 1 Thessalonians for Timothy, exhorting them. This is words of encouragement, commands. What Paul is getting at here is much stronger, much, much stronger than suggestion only. Or this is not what we call a friendly suggestion. It's very serious because this command comes from the Lord, as Paul says, I urge, I ask, in the Lord. Paul even brings this point out more to home when he says, and later on in 1 Thessalonians 4, verse 8, if you reject this teaching on God's way of marriage and pure sexuality, you're not rejecting him. You're rejecting God himself. Look at 1 Thessalonians 4, 8. Therefore, whoever disregards this, that's his teaching, on sexuality, disregards not man, but God, who gives his Holy Spirit to you. And you're quenching the Spirit when you disregard the commands of God. So we s clearly see holiness, God's demands, are not friendly suggestions or an option. This comes from the Lord. Next, he calls us to walk in the Lord or please the Lord in the next part of chapter uh, 4 verse 1 the second part of that verse that as you receive from us how you ought to walk and to please God just as you're doing that you do so more and more note where they received this gospel message of living from they received it from us Paul, Silvanus, and Timothy this word receive is often used actually with regards to receiving the gospel or receiving Jesus Christ as Lord, Colossians 2, 6. It's used in 1 Corinthians 15 twice. It's used actually in 1 Corinthians 11. They received the, uh, the message of, of celebrating the Lord's Supper. And it's also used with regards to receiving Christian ethics, Christian way of living. Well, what did they receive? How they ought to walk? and how they ought to please God. First, let's talk about walking. How one walks, in essence, is how one lives their life. The word walk is used many, many times, Old and New Testament, to speak how you conduct or live your life. If you are described as walking in love, it means you're a loving person. If you walk in wickedness, it means you're carrying out wickedness. They were called to walk in holiness by God in a way that's worthy of the Lord. These Christians in Thessalonica were called into the God's kingdom, called by grace, and they were called to walk in a life that is worthy to the Lord. Just like Paul's already said in 1 Thessalonians 2.12, we exhorted each one of you and encouraged you and charged you, exhorted, encouraged, and charged, what? To walk in a manner... <clears throat> worthy of God who calls you into his own kingdom and glory. 
but they were also instructed here how to please God. In our Canadian culture, pleasing God is like basically the last thing on people's list of whom they want to please. First, it's probably themselves, then their friends, then their family, then their co-workers, maybe of course their boss or whoever, but God is probably on the bottom of the list of the people that they want to please. Often, number one cell, number one whom they want to please themselves. G.K. Beale writes, got this from a commentary, amazing quote. Hear what he says, and it is an indictment against the church in American slash Canadian culture. American, and we can say Canadian culture, is caught up with the grand goal of enjoying life and pleasing oneself. For example, he had read a recent magazine article discussing, discussing a vacation home as investments. And the number one reason to build a vacation home is to enjoy yourself. Today, more than ever, society is caught up with a concern for health and personal well-being. Churches sometimes try and attract people to their services by advertising that what goes on at church will be enjoyable to them. Some churches advertise contemporary music. Coffee will be served throughout the service. Kind of like a Christian Starbucks or Tim Hortons. One can even enjoy breakfast beforehand at a church cafeteria or be entertained by a sitcom-like plays. It's kind of like a breakfast in bed situation. Some of these things may not be bad in and of themselves, but the impression is that the church is attempting to attract people by dangling before them the kinds of pleasures that they can find outside the church. If a church does this consistently, then what it may have to offer may be no different ultimately than what the world offers. We ought not to be worried about pleasing ourselves or even trying to please others, but pleasing God. And how do we please God according to this verse? By obedience to Jesus Christ here and his commands. But note that this church wasn't actually that bad. It says there they were already doing these things just as you are doing. It says there they're not like the church that Jude was writing to where they were actually taking the grace of God and distorting it into sensuality and denying the Lord Jesus. These believers in Thessalonica were already obedient to the Lord, but Paul was calling them to deeper obedience. This here teaches us something very important that no one reaches perfection here on earth. We all have sin. We all have rebellion against God as Christians. We need to eradicate, repent. We need to allow the grace of God and the power of the Holy Spirit to transform us. Here we see that sanctification, as we are describing as becoming more holy, is a progression. Day by day, progressing in the person of Christ, in the grace of God, by the power of the Holy Spirit. Following Jesus means you need to see Christianity more as a long hike rather than a 100 meter dash. There are ups and downs, failures, sadness, sorrow, joys, but you're progressing up this hill or up this mountain till the coming of Christ or your death. So now we can go to our final point. We talked about being urged in the Lord, walking the Lord, and now Paul speaks about where this instruction in the Lord comes from. He says, For you know what instructions we gave you through the Lord Jesus. 4 verse 1, they were asked and urged in the Lord now they're given instructions through the Lord. These believers in Thessalonica know what Paul was uh, giving them, where it came from. It came through the Lord. They confidently know what has been delivered to them by Paul. The word instructions here is a word that's often used with soldiers given marching orders. Can you imagine being in the Canadian or U.S. military military? 
and the sergeant gives you orders and say, well, that's just a friendly suggestion. I don't really need to do that. The person's going to say, if not, give me 20, give me 50 push-ups. We need to view these commands that we've been given here in Thessalonica as orders by God himself. They're to be obeyed to the glory of God. And now we see how these orders were delivered through the Lord Jesus. Here we see the, the apostles truly fulfill the great commission given to them by Jesus. It's a verse we quote so much, but often a lot of passages go back to it. Matthew 28, verse 19 and 20. Go therefore, make disciples all of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Verse 20. Teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. Paul, Silvanus, and Timothy were doing the Great Commission. Teaching them to observe the commands of Christ. Do you hear that? Teaching people to observe and obey all the Lord Jesus had commanded them. Christ Jesus demands obedience and these commands come from himself. They're not an option any more than holiness to the Lord is not an option. Well, how do these introductory verses apply to our hearts, our lives? First, Christ in his grace is the foundation for holiness. We need to be very careful that we don't get into the temptation is, I'm going to try to be holy today because that's what makes me a Christian. I want to obey all these commands and then God will be pleased with me and therefore I'll be a super Christian. We need to be very careful and guard against the self-righteous attitude and the self-justification of works righteousness. No one can make themselves holy by what we do. We need to say this again because we don't want anyone to be in the trap of thinking that what I have done has made me right with God. Meaning we don't want to think that we're attempting to be holy and that makes us holy in the sight of God. Paul is ultra clear about whom saves us, whom makes us right with God because we've actually just brought sin and that separated us from God. Paul says in 1 Thessalonians 5, 9, and 10, For God has not destined us for wrath, but to obtain salvation. Through whom? Our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us. He died for us so that we wouldn't be destined for punishment, the punishment of our sin, and he saved us for the very purpose that we might live for him, whether we are awake or asleep. God has destined his people to obtain salvation and made them holy and blameless through our Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus has accomplished this work by his death. And the purpose of this salvation is so that we might live for him, that we might live in holiness to his glory here on earth. So at the foundation of these commands given to Paul for holiness, love, resisting evil, testing spirits, Showing compassion, being busy, the foundation of all these commands. We need to always keep in mind the grace of Jesus Christ has saved us. The grace of Christ even enables us to live a holy life. And of course, the grace of Christ will keep us all the way home to being with the Lord forever. Just like the song, The Amazing Grace, says... "'Twas grace that taught my heart to fear, and grace my fears relieve. "'Tis grace that has brought me safe thus far, and grace will lead me home." Praise the Lord for his grace. Titus 2, 11-12, "'For the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation for all people.'" Hear what the grace of God does, though? "'Training us.'" to renounce ungodliness, worldly passions, and to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in this present age. So the grace of God is at the foundation of our obedience. Today, if you recognize that you cannot be holy in the sight of God, look to Christ. Look to His grace. Trust His wonderful work. Be saved by the blood of Christ. Next, but we are called to be holy. Holy. 
because we have another temptation on the horizon. It's called, a big word here, antinomianism. Two Greek words crammed into one, basically saying anti namos which means anti-law, meaning that we could be tempted to be against the laws and the commands of God. And because we've experienced grace, we don't really need to worry about obedience to God. We see this as well in the book of Jude. The commands and demands of our Master and Lord Jesus were being disregarded. And it's be it becomes a big problem in our life sometimes. It's become a big problem in the Church of Canada. We have a hole in our obedience and in our holiness. The idea is that the grace of God forgives, so let's not be too concerned about holiness. Let's sin so that God's grace may increase, and sin just becomes mistakes and bad habits and not as rebellion against a holy God. Friends, let us not that let let's that let us not have that attitude at all. Hear what Paul says a few verses later. In 1 Thessalonians 4 3, it's the will of God your sanctification. That's what he, his will for your life if you're a believer. You become more and more holy. You abstain from sexual immorality. Look at 1 Thessalonians 4, 7. For God has not called us for impurity, but in holiness. Our very calling. He's called us and saved us for holiness. It's God's will that we're holy. We're called and saved by grace. Not to walk in impurity and wickedness, but for holy living. Let us be holy as God is holy. And finally, let's pray for each other's holiness. It's no mistake that Paul prays for their holiness to progress and then launches in for instructions that was lacking in their faith and their love. And then what follows these instructions is another prayer for holiness and for, for their progressive holiness. Much like gospel work is God's work, sanctification work is God's work. The progression of us becoming more holy is God's work. We work with God in that. We become holy by God's grace, but we seek to be obedient to God in holiness. And that's why Paul cries out to God. Are you disturbed by a sin that you're struggling with? Maybe it's lust. Maybe it's unloving. A loving, unloving attitude. Cry out to God and then pray that He would sanctify you completely. Maybe you're disturbed by a, a sin that your friend is committing. Cry out to the Lord that by God's grace and by the conviction of the Holy Spirit, they would grow in holiness. Or maybe you think, well, I'm just progressing in holiness just fine. Then pray that God would progress you by His grace and by the power of the Holy Spirit more and more. As we seek to be holy, let's recognize two things. Christ's grace is at the foundation of it. So let's cry out to God and pray that he would do this work of a progressing holiness to his glory. Amen.